Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see all kinds of questions here saved up. So let's see one here from Architect. Uh, does evolution move towards complexity or simplicity? Interesting question. So first of all, what are we talking about here? We're talking about uh, presumably biological evolution. And we're talking about the progression of species that uh, we can see, for example, in the fossil record, we go back, you know, 65 million years and we start seeing dinosaur fossils. We go back a bit more, we see trilobite fossils. We go back even further, we see fossils of other kinds of organisms until I think the oldest fossils might be about 2 billion years old, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, maybe 2.5 billion years, which are most little single-celled organisms and so on. And so there's sort of this, this appearance in the fossil record that over the course of time, the organisms that have populated the earth have gotten more complicated. And we look at ourselves and we say, gosh, we've got all this complicated stuff in us humans. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, the, we're the, uh, the finest production of the process of evolution, so we might think. So, but the question is, is this really a thing that, that things get more complicated over time? You know, Charles Darwin, who originally developed this theory of evolution by natural selection, thought that it was. I mean, in, uh, so, so the, you know, the, the, the big idea of evolution is organisms have, uh, you know, have descendants, they have their children organisms and so on. Um, and uh, at every generation, there are random mutations, random changes in what we now assume is mostly the genetics of the organism. There are probably some other aspects of the organism that sort of get carried along from, from the parent organism to the child organism that aren't quite just what's in the pure uh, DNA code of the organism. But it's roughly things getting passed from parents to children, and that every time, every time you go from parents to children, there's a certain kind of random change that can happen. And the whole point of evolution by natural selection is, if you're a critter whose random change is beneficial, so you have a uh, you know a better life, and then you're able to have more children, then that change, then then you will tend to pass that change to your children and there'll be more of them, so they have a chance to pass it to more children. And gradually, whatever changes were a good idea, end up winning out, and all the organisms end up getting that change. And the things that were a bad idea, those organisms had fewer children, and the changes that they had will tend to die out. That's kind of the, the theory of natural selection, uh, of evolution by natural selection. One of the things that's been mysterious is there clearly are big changes from the trilobites or something to us humans, big changes, but from, from one of those to the other. And the question is, how did those big changes really happen? And people have seen evidence in, in actual examples in field biology of evolution in action. So, you know, there are famous examples of, I don't know, there's a kind of moth, for example, that uh, in places where there was no grimy industrial pollution, the moth was, was quite white, and that was a good color for it, because the things that it had to uh, land on and camouflage itself around were also quite white, but when there was grimy industrial pollution, it was a sort of a, a darker color, and the moths that were, that for random, in their random mutations, the moths that were darker colors ended up being more successful, less likely to be eaten, um, and more children moths, and so the the, uh, the darker color won out. And there there are many examples of that that have been sort of seen in uh, in in actual sort of practical uh, observation of the operation of natural of evolution by natural selection. Now, in in higher organisms like moths and and uh, I don't know, mammals and things like that, it's it's a little bit hard to see that evolution in action. In microorganisms, things like bacteria, viruses, you can see that evolution much more easily. And so, for example, in uh, well, sort of uh, in, in in the pandemic, for example, we've seen all kinds of evolution in the virus 
um, responding to, oh, it's blocked from being this way because, I don't know, there's a vaccine that's, that's causing people to not get sick of the virus has that form. Oh, if the virus changes a bit, then the virus can be more successful for the virus and uh, manage to get passed on more and so on. And so that will be the, the variant that wins out. You see the same thing at a more microscopic level. If you have bacteria, for example, and you're growing them, uh, people grow bacteria on, you know, on plates and so on. They give them kind of sugar type solution that they consume and the bacteria will just replicate their more and more bacteria. Uh, the thing that's sort of real bad for bacteria is antibiotics. Antibiotic drugs kill bacteria um, and they do it by a variety of different mechanisms. And so one thing you could do is on, on a kind of a plate where, you're, where you have these bacteria growing, you put some antibiotic on it and you see that at first all the bacteria that sort of get to where the antibiotic is, they just die out. But then gradually, as the more and more bacteria replicate, and bacteria replicates, I don't know how long it takes, maybe, maybe half an hour for a bacterium to make child bacteria, so to speak, um, that, uh, uh, so they're replicating much quite quickly, and there are lots and lots of sort of uh, different variants of the bacteria that get produced, and maybe one of them is successful at getting through the antibiotic, and then that one wins out and there are many, many more copies of it and so on. Then maybe you put some more antibiotic, different kind of antibiotic on this plate and you'll see the same thing happen again. So you can see this process of evolution happen in a very direct way in, in something like, you know, plates with bacteria on them. You can literally see, you know, in different colors of bacteria, you can see that, oh yes, this kind of color, uh, I don't know exactly whether they're real colors or whether they're only colors that can be seen under a microscope with them. Um, uh, with particular ways of treating light. But um, in any case, you kind of see evolution really in action um, as the bacteria kind of quotes learn um, to uh, modify themselves to avoid um, the, the antibiotic. When I say modify themselves, I mean, there are, that's not really what happens. What really happens is one bacterium has a child bacterium, which has a child bacterium and so on. And at every stage, there is a random mutation and of the, I don't know, uh, you know, let's say there were 10 child bacteria produced. One of them is more successful than the others because for example, it doesn't get killed off by the antibiotic. And then that's the one that gets to replicate and have its children. And so the traits that it has, which let it survive the antibiotic get passed to its children and that keeps going from there. So, so we've seen lots of examples now of sort of biological evolution by natural selection in effect in action. Um, the question is, does natural selection lead inevitably to the production of more and more complex organisms? And, and famously, Charles Darwin uh, sort of assumed that it did. And even the very last sentence of his Origin of Species book from uh, 1859 or so um, was, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, it, its last sentence was something like, just as the earth is, keeps on circling around the sun according to the fixed law of gravity. So in other words, that's a sort of physical inevitability that the earth is gonna keep circling around the sun according to this law of gravity. So he assumed uh, organisms, he didn't quite say more complex, but he kind of implied that progressively more complex organisms are being and will continue to evolve through natural selection in the future. So he thought that there might be some fundamental natural law that says that over the course of biological evolution, you would, um, uh, uh, you would have um, uh, progressively more complex organisms produced. Nobody ever managed to figure that out. It's not something we really know happens. Um, in it's, there are sort of toy models of evolution where things a bit like that happen, but it's not totally convincing. And sometimes, sort of the bad case for us proud complex organisms on earth is, you know, maybe there's actually a really simple organism, maybe it's a virus, maybe it's something else, which can just tear its way through all of the complex life on earth and be the most successful organism and take over the planet. We don't know that that's not the case. Uh, let's hope it's not the case for, for our species, so to speak, but we don't know that's not the case, that the most successful organism won't actually be a pretty simple organism. I remember, uh, you know, when people are doing these, um, oh, you know, you, you make, I don't know what it is, battle bots or something like that, you know, these, 
these things you make out of Lego, you make out of other kinds of things. You kind of have your, your little you know, Lego car and you're trying to bash it into other Lego cars and, and have, you know, see who, who wins, so to speak. Uh, it is not always the case that the most complex design is the one that wins. Sometimes it's a simpler design that wins. And we don't really know that that isn't the case for biology. Now, what tends to happen in biology is a little bit like what happens in technology, which is that you'll have, there, there are ideas, there are sort of new innovations, like, you know, the trilobites had the innovative idea of having eyes that could detect light. Other organisms had, you know, innovative ideas like living on the land or doing photosynthesis, those kinds of things. What happens is over the course of biological evolution, a new idea will show up. Something, some, some new way of doing things will show up. And particularly at the beginning, it's often a huge win. Like when plants first came on the land in the Carboniferous period, huge win, tons of plants all over the planet. That's what led us to you know, a bunch of fossil fuel deposits from that period of time because there was so much plant life because there was sort of no competition and it was just the thing that covered the planet. And, and then gradually, well, that idea gets, you know, there are other ideas that come in and so on. But this notion of over the course of time, eventually some new idea comes in and then sort of biological evolution rides that idea for a while, that's a pretty common thing to see. And so one of the things that you see in, in by now in biological evolution is we are the composite of many ideas. Some of them are good ideas, some of them might not be such good ideas. What you also quite often see in the fossil record is, for example, let's say trilobites. Um, they were a very successful collection of organisms and they lasted, I don't know, hundreds of millions of years, I think, um, altogether. Um, and, you know, the first ones look kind of simple and then they get more ornate and they've got these little sort of, uh, you know, antennas hanging out and they've got more complicated leg patterns and segments and things. They get more and more complicated. They get all kinds of, not quite hair, but all kinds of detailed stuff on them. And then in the later stages of trilobites, they actually get simpler again. And you see that quite often with technology. People say, well, we've just first of all managed to get, I don't know, a graphical user interface to work on a computer. It'll be pretty simple. Or the early computer games, pretty simple. And, um, and then people say, look, we can add all this stuff. And look, we've got this feature and that feature and the other feature. And then it gets much more complicated. And then often in the end, people realize what's important and what's not, and it gets simpler again. And the same thing happens in biological evolution, that the, the, all of those elaborate feathery things on the trilobites turned out it didn't matter and turned out producing those feathery things, well, who knows, maybe they could get tangled up in some plant or some such other thing. And it was actually a lose for the trilobite, just as you, know, you make a more complicated user interface well, maybe the users get confused and they stop buying your product. And uh, you'd be better off having fewer features, fewer buttons on your user interface that will actually be a more fit user interface, so to speak. So that, that, that kind of thing happens. Now, there's sort of a question of, you know, is there a force towards sort of adding more innovations in biological organisms to make things sort of more complicated? There are many things that are quite mysterious still in biology. For example, why is it that there are as many organisms as there are? We don't know exactly how many, but there are probably close to 10 million different species on the earth. Why so many? There's a law that, that uh, sometimes claimed, I think it may be somewhat accurate, but if you have an island, that the number of species on the island is somehow proportional to the size of the island, according to some power law formula. Um, but you know, and that, that sort of a, the bigger island allows more stuff to go on and there are more different species. But why should there be more species? Why isn't it just that there's a successful species and it's the winner? Well, that's a complicated question. It's a complicated question for an individual species. It's also a complicated question for groups of species. By the time you're dealing with groups of species, you have to think about sort of who eats who and how these different species interact with each other. I mean, the most common issue is food webs of uh, you know, basically one organism eats the, big, the smaller organism and so on, or eats other organisms. And there's this sort of gradual, there's this sort of chain of, uh, of trophic levels of who eats who. And like, I think on the land, there are a limited number, like four or five trophic levels. In the ocean, there are like 20 or something often. And it's kind of in the, the bigger fish theory. There's always you know, the little tiny plankton and they're eaten by the bigger thing and the bigger thing and the bigger thing. And eventually 
there's always a bigger fish type type theory of, of how things work. And that leads to this pretty complicated set of interdependencies between the different species in the ocean, for example. And I think, so that, that's, that's at the level of interspecies interactions. At the level of an individual species, the question is sort of, uh, you know, wh why should there be many different species? Why should there be uh, a sort of, uh, why is it the case that we don't see on the surface of the earth, we see some species that are pretty widely spread uh, across the whole surface of the earth and we see others that are just in specific places. You know, we see the marsupials in Australia. Why aren't there marsupials in other places? Why, uh, why do we see, you know, particular kinds of plants in particular areas? Sometimes a particular plant will be particularly adapted to live in the rainforest in some, in some different kind of environment or some animal will be, you know, it's, it's kind of probably a lose if you're a, a polar bearish animal with very thick fur and you're white and you're kind of trying to hang out in the tropics, that's probably not going to happen. Um, it's uh, just as, um, so there's some differentiation of that type, but the question of why are there quite the number of species that there are, there isn't a good theory for that. We don't know. Um, it's, it's a, um, and I think that that, that kind of, um, uh, there, there's sort of a, the thing to realize is as, as you change the genome of a species, the genome is like a program and there are a very infinite number of possible programs and there's great diversity in the kinds of organisms you could make. I mean, imagine, you know, people sometimes in science fiction movies have had the kind of the, the, uh, the genetics hacker who's created these weird creatures that, you know, open doors for them or whatever else it is. Um, and uh, that hasn't really been a, a real thing yet um, of being able, and, and perhaps it's a good thing, it hasn't been a real thing because there are all kinds of problems that could arise from it, but um, of being able to have sort of special purpose organisms, large organisms created to achieve a particular purpose. That, that's been done lots in microorganisms and bacteria. Um, many drugs, for example, are manufactured by having a bacterium whose genetic program has been modified so that one of the proteins, one of the things it produces is the drug you want, like insulin, for example. Um, that's a very common thing to use uh, E. coli, which are type of bacteria that live in our guts and so on. Um, and you basically just have lots of E. coli that have been modified to not just do the usual E. coli thing, but to also have these, these extra pieces of program that make something that's useful for us. But in terms of large scale organisms, we don't know how to make an organism that you know has a uh, oh I don't know a, 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 I don't know a, a, an organism that um, can act like a robotic vacuum cleaner or something and go round and, and you know we, we have to make do with you know the, the pets that we have uh, sort of uh, observed will will do particular kinds of things we we don't get to make a sort of programmed uh, you know a programmed mammal or something that will go and uh, and do all the things a vacuum cleaner would do or some such other thing. We don't know how to do that yet. Um, presumably it's possible in principle, presumably there is a genetic program which would make such an organism, but we don't know what it is. Um, and we don't have a good way of doing sort of progressive design to, to get to that point. One might think just as evolution does this very slow process of randomly making a change, seeing whether it works out, randomly making a change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that if we could just sit down with a kind of computer aided design program and just say, let's just start from scratch. Let's design our genetics so that we get an organism that has particular properties, that that would be a winning thing to do. And one day maybe it will be, but it's very hard. It's a kind of a problem. It's sort of a computationally irreducible problem to go from the genetic sequence to the actual behavior of the organism. Now people, there's a whole field of synthetic biology where people try to design at the level typically of microorganisms try to design organisms that will have particular properties. Like, you know, a good example of one that people tried, it didn't work out very well, was, uh, you know, a, a bacterium-like organism that makes gasoline. Um, you know, it's like, forget having, you know, it's something you can, uh, that didn't work out, I think, primarily because uh, you couldn't get the organism to not get sort of killed off by, by the gasoline that it had produced, so to speak. But you know, that's the type of idea of, can you just make an organism that will be custom designed to have a particular purpose? And you know, there's, it's not clear where the boundaries are, and it's certainly not known 
how to go from scratch to build an organism that has, you know, particular, that's some kind of cute organism with, you know, uh, purple wings and all kinds of other stuff. Nobody knows how to do that stuff yet. I think this question of whether there is a um, uh, sort of the, the sort of increase in complexity and how that plays out with evolution. So another thing to say is that the, the what organisms are successful depends on in large part on the environments in which the organisms find themselves. And this is again the question of is the most successful organism the sleek, very simple organism that just knows how to you know turn everything into copies of itself versus the very elaborate kind of Swiss army knife organism that says, oh, I found myself in a glacier. Let me go and start, you know, let me deploy my skis, so to speak. I found myself in a, you know, in the top of a tree. Let me, let me deploy my, my wing system, so to speak. You know, something which has all these different uh, bells and whistles, so to speak, on the organism that it can deploy for different purposes. For example, you know, what is the winning case? Is it the kind of the, the very simple, I mean, people talk about uh, in a slightly different context, in the context of nanotechnology, of being able to make uh, kind of arbitrary molecules, not, not, um, not biology, but one of the things that was a concern at one time was if we managed to figure out how to make essentially self-replicating very small scale molecules, that those small scale molecules will just replicate everywhere and will turn the whole of our planet into gray goo or something, as all those molecules just make copies of the molecules, forget about all these complicated organisms, the most successful thing in that theory of what might happen is the gray goo, and so that's what our planet gets turned into. So it's, it's just not clear what makes for the most successful organism. Now, you can ask the question, given the environment that, and given sort of what changes genetics can make, is there some kind of principle about the environment is somehow very coarse compared to the details of what can happen in the genetics? And does that have an implication for sort of the types of things that the genetics could ever achieve? Let me try to explain that a little bit more. Um, and it's something actually I've been thinking about somewhat recently and I don't really know the full story of it. But uh, you know, with the genetics, you could achieve, you could in principle make that, you know, creature with purple wings and uh, a green tail and you know, all kinds of other features. Um, but it requires sort of very detailed, careful sort of uh, careful setup of, the, of it, the genetics of the organism to get to that point. Now you imagine the environment in which the organism lives and it has a fairly coarse way of affecting the success of the organism. Like, if the organism has big, thick fur and it's trying to live at the equator, bad news. But it's not the case that, you know, let's say the polar bears had, oh, I don't know, uh, that's a good example. Um, I, that's perhaps not the best example. Let me think. I mean, in, in a, let's say a, a tree, let's say the leaves of trees. I've looked at those a bit. Um, those are interesting because nobody really knows why they're the shapes they are. That is, some leaves are very simple. They have just a very rounded shape. Some leaves have the very serrated edges. Some leaves, like oak leaves, have all these sort of indentations and so on. There are all these names that have been given to the shapes of leaves that actually come from, from antiquity. They're very Latin-type names, like dentate, which, you know, is like, like teeth-like shaped, and um, uh, the um, obovate, and they're all, all kinds of names. They're actually, you can find them even in the, um, in the books where people were trying to describe, uh, you know, pick up these plants, they will be good for you type things. Um, and they were identifying these plants by saying the shapes of their leaves. But anyway, they're, they're very elaborate shapes of leaves. Nobody knows why the leaves of different plants are the shapes they are. It doesn't seem to, it's like, well, it so happens that an oak tree has leaves of that shape. It so happens that a such and such tree has leaves of some other shape. Those are things that, seem like they don't seem to matter much in detail to the organism. There are some features of leaves, like I think plants that live in the tropics, they have a, a drip tip at the end of their leaf so that moisture that's formed on the leaf can drip off the end of the leaf, things like that. Um, but that's a case where the question is, does the environment sort of, does it control the plants well enough 
to be able to say, okay, you have a leaf that's this particular shape, or is the environment this, this much coarser constraint on what's going on? And within those constraints, the plants are sort of moving around, trying, trying different shapes. You know, one thing I, I looked at years ago um, is uh, uh, the, the uh, shapes of mollusks. And I happen to realize I have a convenient mollusk here. Here's a mollusk, yes, there we go. That's a, um, you know, these mollusks grow in this kind of spiral shape and they, um, uh, they have, yeah, it's, that's, that's the non-virtual background type uh, theory of things. Um, the, uh, uh, and the question is what different shapes, um, the, uh, you know, what, what different shapes can these mollusks grow? And one of the things I was curious about is if you imagine that they have a definite sort of steam for growing where they just are making kind of a spiral where the different sides of the spiral grow at different rates, can all possible shapes be formed and are they actually used by biology? And the answer is they are all used by biology. It's so it seems, except for rather trivial ones, like ones where the whole shell kind of closes up and there's no space for the animal inside. So in any case, I, I think the, the, the answer to the original question about does biological evolution lead to complexity rather than simplicity is we don't really know. And uh, there are places where sort of complexity seems to be winning out. There are other places, the fact that, you know, we're this complex organism and viruses still have a big effect on us, even though they're very simple in some, by many measures relative to us, um, is kind of a sign that we haven't sort of, complexity hasn't won, so to speak. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's still, it's kind of an unsolved problem in the theory, in the sort of meta theory in a sense of biological evolution. It's one that I think some ideas from our physics project and some of the formalism of multi-computation and so on may very well have some really powerful things to say about these questions of sort of what are these trends, these overall trends in biological evolution? Why are there different species? Why are there the numbers of species that there are? I mean, I'd like to be able to estimate, you know, why are there 10 million species on the earth? You know, given the, the size of the earth, the age of the earth, this and that and the other, why are there 10 million species? We don't know. And uh, uh, that, that's, some, that's something I'd be curious to understand. Um, okay, there's a bunch of biology questions here, so let me take a look at these. Um, okay, this is a, uh, from Parmenides, this is an interesting one. It says, we should breed streamophile bacteria and algae to terraform planets by slowly exposing them to toxic atmospheres. That's actually kind of an interesting idea. So let me, let me explain the pieces of that. Um, so extremophiles are critters that live in, in extreme environments, like the hydrothermal vents in the ocean, where there's very high temperatures, where there's lots of sulfur, lots of kinds of things that your average organism, like us, like the bacteria in our guts, like other like the you know ants and things like that, they just die in that those environments. They'd be they'd be cooked, they'd be you know killed by the sulfur, all those kinds of things. But there are organisms that have evolved to be able to exist in those extreme environments and to be able to be successful there. In fact, there are theories that say that the original life on Earth might have been in those places, and it's only uh, us kind of um, uh, less uh, you know we're the we're the kind of um, the weak creatures that manage to survive even in, in the non-extreme non environment, but the, the real things that started life were the hardier things that could live in these extreme environments. Not clear whether that's true or not. So the, the comment being made here is about terraforming planets. So what is terraforming a planet? So, you know, on the earth, we have a nice atmosphere with, you know, 20-ish percent oxygen, 78 percent-ish uh, nitrogen and so on. We have, um, uh, and we have, um, you know, we have, we have an environment in which, which is good for us. Now, you know, the environment probably was the one that came first and we evolved to be able to live happily in that environment. But now if we look at Mars and Venus, um, they both have atmospheres that aren't very hospitable to us. You know, Mars has a very thin atmosphere, uh, mostly carbon dioxide, um, uh, and and um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, we don't have there's no breathable air there at the at the kind of pressures that we would need to to exist without a spacesuit on Mars. Venus has thick, I think, carbon dioxide and maybe methane. I'm not sure. Clouds, 
I'm uh, trying to think. I'm not sure what the clouds are made of. I think there's a lot of carbon dioxide there. But Venus is covered with a shroud of clouds, and the surface of Venus is like 350 degrees um, centigrade, I think. Uh, it's extremely hot. Um, and so there's this question of could you terraform, could you turn these planets into being like Earth by somehow using, for example, biological organisms? Could you, for example, put some kind of bacteria into the clouds of Venus and have them start uh, transforming? Just, just like on the Earth, if we plant enough trees, the trees will, the, 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 the trees turn carbon dioxide into oxygen. They, um, uh, that's uh, uh, with, you know, with, the, with using sunlight, the photosynthesis turns, uh, takes in carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. And so if we think there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of the earth, it's kind of have more trees is, is one of the solutions to that. And, um, uh, but that's a place where you're using biology to change the chemistry of the atmosphere. And so the idea would be on Venus, have some kind of bacterium that can kind of initially live in the clouds on Venus and, and it'll start you know, maybe in the higher clouds where it's not as, not as hot. And then it starts transforming carbon dioxide into oxygen. And pretty soon you've changed the whole atmosphere of Venus. So that's, that's kind of the, the concept. Would it work? People have discussed that for years. I think the current belief is with the technology we have now, it won't work. Um, the, the question of what Parmenides is suggesting is that maybe we could essentially evolve bacteria that would be more successful in terraforming Venus. And, and I think that's quite possibly the case. I mean, this is a question of, of how far can you push life that's been constructed with RNA and DNA and proteins and amino acids and so on? How far can you push it? You probably can't push it to 350 degrees. Um, it's, but it's probably really too hot. Probably the fundamental chemistry is just inappropriate for that. But if you can kind of work down from the top of the clouds where it isn't as hot, maybe there's a way to sort of do the equivalent of photosynthesis on Venus and transform all that carbon dioxide into oxygen, which will then have, you know, not have these uh, opaque clouds, which would then allow more heat to be released, cool the surface, and pretty soon you have a, a, a great tourist resort on Venus type thing. Mars, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I think one suggestion about Mars that has a certain degree of craziness to it is the ice caps of Mars have, have uh, 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 froze, uh, water ice in them. And one idea is, you explode, you know, collections of hydrogen bombs at the at the uh, poles of Mars, and you push up all that water that was was in the ice. You make it, uh, you vaporize it, and you put it up into the into the atmosphere of Mars, and that that's the way that you begin the process of terraforming Mars. Again, I don't really know if that would actually work, and it's sort of an interesting question of of sort of an ethics type question. Of people worry a lot about sort of defacing the Earth and destroying species on the Earth. And if we are sure that Venus and Mars are just rocks, nothing like life there, then maybe we feel okay about just sort of completely whatever was there, we obliterate it and we come in and colonize type thing. Um, we might feel more squeamish if we felt like, well, there might be some microorganism there. Now, if it's a microorganism that's bizarrely different from life we've ever seen, then we wouldn't even recognize it as life, we probably feel less squeamish. It's kind of a, a complicated sort of ethics scale of what's involved in, in doing that. And, and, you know, do we really feel okay about taking that nearby planet and saying, okay, it's going to be ours? Uh, I, I, I would kind of think like, um, you know, we, the, personally, I, I think that's probably not a difficult thing to decide, but it's something it's not, it's not I think, totally self-evident. Um, okay, there are all kinds of questions here. Uh, Can bacteria be diabetic, Aaron asks. Wow. Um, well, let's think about that for a second. So diabetes is a human disease. There are really two kinds, type one, and type two diabetes. Um, that is, they're both uh, associated with insulin, which is an enzyme that um, is involved in metabolism. And um, the, uh, and in particular is involved in using up, using glucose, using um, the, uh, um, uh, using the, the um, uh, when, when you eat food, 
it has glucose in it, you're going to use that to metabolize, you're essentially going to burn the glucose to make energy. And insulin is part of that process. And insulin is produced by the pancreas, pancreas gland in, in us, by the beta cells in the, in the pancreas. And um, type 1 diabetes uh, is a disease usually manifests in, in early life where uh, the immune system starts attacking the beta cells of the pancreas, which are the things that produce insulin. And uh, nobody knows why that happens. Um, and although there's some genetics that um, uh, may increase the, the likelihood of that happening, but in any case, the immune system, for whatever reason, goes and starts attacking cells that are part of, part of, of you, which is bad, and it will destroy the beta cells in the pancreas, which means that you can't produce insulin yourself anymore. You need insulin to be able to, to metabolize things like glucose, sugar, and so on. And so you end up having to, in modern times, I mean, this is for the last 100 years, at least since insulin was discovered, you kind of inject or infuse insulin into yourself at the appropriate rate so that you can, uh, uh, so that you can go ahead and do your usual metab uh, metabolism. Uh, type 2 diabetes is, is something that usually manifests at later ages, and it's, uh, uh, it's a thing where the, um, uh, the effect of, of um, the, you're producing insulin, but it doesn't have the effect that it would usually have, and so you have to kind of give yourself more insulin to be able to have the effect you would want the insulin to have. So the question is, is, is insulin, I believe that insulin is something that has been used for like at least a billion years in the history of life on earth. Um, and I think, I don't know whether, I mean, there are, there are things called SIRT, G-S-I-R-T genes, if I remember correctly, which are some kind of thing related to insulin. And I'm afraid this is going beyond my immediate memory. Um, there's, a, there's a quite a lot of belief about the relationship of those genes to aging and so on. But um, the, the, I think the question really is, um, is it the case that you can have a bacterium? I, I mentioned that you can produce insulin in a bacterium. You can produce human insulin in a bacterium by putting the genetic code for human insulin into the code for a bacterium and having it just, okay, I'm going to produce proteins for myself. Well, actually, I'm producing proteins for, that correspond to the code I was given that, that correspond to human insulin. Um, and I think the question is, is I don't know I don't know exactly what the, I don't know, I assume that there is an analog of that in bacteria, a similar kind of enzyme, and that it's possible for the bacteria to not produce that enzyme, in which case, or, or to be genetically modified so they can't produce it, in which case they would have sort of the analog of type 1 diabetes, I think, not sure. Um, let's see, question about, from Mikhail, about... Uh, um, did Craig Venter indeed create synthetic life or just change existing species? Um, the, I think it's correct to say that nobody has really produced a, 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 a living organism completely from scratch. Now, you know, there are mechanisms like how does the replication work? How does the you know, RNA come off the DNA, how does the, how does the ribosome work, things like that. Um, yeah, in fact, th those, those things, we've kind of gotten those from biological evolution. Now, how those get put together to decide exactly what kinds of other proteins the thing produces, what characteristics the organism will have, that's kind of the stuff of synthetic biology, potentially. And people talk about having sort of modular pieces of, of, uh, of essentially genetics, to be able to fit them together, to have a sort of a construction kit to have organisms do different kinds of things. Um, I, I think that's still a, a kind of an early stage activity, very artisanal and not very, it's not a sort of industrial scale thing at this point. Um, I mean, the, again, whenever you modify the genes of a bacterium to like make human insulin or something, you're doing something a bit like that. You're, you're modifying the sort of the code of an organism for a particular purpose. But I think the idea of let's just start from scratch, um, that's, that's not a thing that's been possible yet. I mean, if you're going to start from scratch, maybe there's a better mechanism than the ribosomes that walk down RNA strands making proteins. You know, they're a great big molecule that has, you know, this, all this sort of complexity in it 
that sort of you know lead one thing, add these pieces from from the environment to make the next step in the in the amino acid and so on, have the thing peel off all those kinds of things. It's kind of it's kind of neat. It's a pretty big molecule, and um, uh, you know you might imagine that some engineer could come along and say, I've got a better way to do this. Actually, there's a really tiny molecule that will succeed in in achieving the same purpose. But that's not something we've we've done yet or know how to do. Um, the uh, uh, so so that's the primary. I mean, so-called genetic engineering is um, uh, is all about modifying existing uh, tends to be about modifying existing organisms, typically bacteria, um, for these purposes. Now, the application of that to humans is some um, uh, so-called gene therapy. Um, and so, okay, so in humans, normally we have our genetic sequence and it's six billion base pairs long and we're born with it. And every, every cell in our body has that same six billion base pair sequence in it. Now there are things called retroviruses that can go and basically write back data into, the, into, the, into our genome. So, you know, it's one of the, if you sort of catch a retrovirus it can modify, it can actually go and write it, some of its genetics back into our genome. And in fact, if we look at our genomes today, there are lots of pieces of our genome that were undoubtedly added by retroviruses in the past that were then passed down from, from, one, uh, uh, from one organism to another. And so that's a thing that can happen. If you, if you can get to an organism and have a retrovirus change its genetics, then it will really have changed the genetics and it will pass down those genetics to its progeny and so on. So one of the things that happens is it will also pass it down to new cells that are created within that same organism. And so for example, there are diseases where there, it's known that those diseases are the result of, of particular genetic modifications in, in human genome. And if you can just go and essentially edit those modifications, um, then you can, uh, uh, then you could change that. Now, one of the big things that's happened in the last 10 years is this um, uh, idea of gene editing, this CRISPR-Cas9 mechanism. This is a thing that originally came from, uh, let's see if I can get the history right. It came from viruses that infect bacteria. And it was kind of a clever use of some mechanisms that existed in nature. But the end result is that you can essentially make your own retrovirus and you can essentially specify a genetic sequence and say, okay, here's, here's more or less how it works. Uh, on the genome, there's lots of ATCG, there's a big sort of random looking sequence of those things. Any given sequence more than about, I don't know, eight or nine letters long, the chances are that's only gonna occur once or maybe no times at all. Let's say you have a length 10 sequence of A's and G's and G's and C's and so on the chances are a random such sequence will just never occur in the human genome. But many length 10 sequences, let's say, do occur. And so if you have some molecules just sort of floating around and it's kind of you know, checking out whether a particular sequence that might exist on that molecule matches a sequence that's on the human genome, then there's probably a unique place where that length 10 sequence matches. So what happens in gene editing is that you are basically you, you put the payload that you want to deliver to the genome sort of in between something which essentially is matching flanking sequences. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna have this length 10 sequence on the left, length 10 sequence on the right, let's say, not sure what the typical lengths actually are, but let's say length 10. And you're gonna say, float around the genome, you know, float around, find places where that length 10 sequence matches. Okay, that length 10 sequence is matching in, I don't know, some, uh, part of the genome that produces some uh, uh, some uh, uh, some some protein that's relevant for the human retina, let's say. Um, then you um, and then what will happen is the thing will lock on in that place, and this mechanism, this gene editing mechanism, will basically edit out the piece of the genome that's in between those flanking sequences and put in its own payload, so that it actually modifies the genome of the organism. And, and that's, that's a, a potential approach to treat some diseases. Um, it's, there's been a complicated history in trials of that kind of thing. Sometimes then some, some things that have gone wrong, some things that have gone right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, it's, it's some, uh, the, um, 
so so that um, that's the that's kind of the the way that you potentially insert yourself into into sort of the genomes of an organism. Now, you know, people talk about so when one of the ideas was, you know, diseases like malaria are a big deal, particularly in places like Africa, and there was sort of this idea uh, malaria is is carried by uh, by mosquitoes, and if you can modify the mosquitoes um, to not, I'm trying to remember the details of this, but but you can, I don't think you're actually killing off the mosquitoes. I think you're just modifying them so they can't carry the malaria parasite or some such other thing. Um, but in any case, the the, um, uh, the the idea was, is that with this gene editing thing, you could potentially uh, introduce into the mosquito population a modified genome. And that modified genome could somehow be more successful than all the other genetics of the mosquitoes, and you would essentially drive that gen genetic modification into the mosquito population, thereby uh, basically changing all the mosquitoes to not be able to carry malaria, for example. Okay, this is in the category of, you know, it's a science idea, and the it's in the what could possibly go wrong category of, of um, uh, you know, by the time you let out loose this thing that is just going and, and, and modifying uh, kind of the, um, the uh, uh, sort of not only modifying one organism, but mod modifying all of its child organisms, it's, there are, that's a little bit of a scary thing to do, and, and many things could potentially go wrong. Um, so it hasn't, to my knowledge, been done yet. Um, and, uh, uh, but that's the kind of thing that becomes possible with gene editing. Let's see. Uh, RBS comments, maybe there are as many species on Earth as there are different cellular automaton rules that exhibit DNA patterns of mechanical structure of an organism. I think there are, you know, this is the question of, of you know, when you see people drawing pictures of possible aliens, and uh, sometimes uh, there's, a, there's a lovely book I have of, of uh, somebody collected kind of all the different renderings of, of different kinds of aliens. I have to say that many of them are surprisingly unimaginative. They're basically a plant with an animal head or you know, other things that look very much like just sort of composites of terrestrial organisms. But there are some more imaginative things as well. And I have to believe that, that the full the, the programmability of biology is vastly greater than what's actually been achieved um, in, in biological organisms. I mean, the example of mollusk shells where the different sort of growth rates have been filled out, yes, that's a case where it's been filled out. But I think if we look at the vast space of possible organisms, conceivable organisms, we have explored a just absolutely tiny region of that space. It's an interesting question whether uh, sort of to what extent, you know, how unusual is the stuff out there in that space? We know a little bit about that because we can do an analogous thing with programs, particularly these things called cellular automata that I've spent lots of time studying. We just have a line of cells and each cell updates its color according to the colors of its neighbors, according to some fixed rule. And as you change the rule, you'll get different patterns. And those patterns often look rather lifelike and have all kinds of things that you'd say, oh, that must've been made by something biological um, no, it's really made by this very simple rule. And there's sort of a question of, of how diverse is the possible behavior of those things like cellular automata and how, how much, if you saw those different pictures, how much would you identify it as, oh, those are, you know, let, let's say in the tree of life, we have plants, we have animals, we have archaeo, bacteria, or whatever, uh, the archaea, we have, uh, you know, mammals, we have birds, we have fish, we have whatever else. Those are sort of big clumps of stuff. And we could identify long before anybody knew anything about genetics, we could say, that's a fish, that's a bird. They were morphologically, they're structurally different. And so we can ask for cellular automata, can you uh, sort of put them in these buckets that are like the fish versus birds bucket and so on. Many years ago, I discovered that there were, at least at the simplest level, there are basically four classes of behavior you see that are sort of the very top level uh, kind of types of behavior, a little bit like solids, liquids, gases for materials. There's similar kinds of 
different types of behavior for different rules of cellular automata. But it's an interesting question and one actually should be looked at again now. Um, whether there's a, a kind of a, a sort of a way of looking at sort of speciation in cellular automata where you'd say, well, it's not exactly the same pattern, but it's a pattern of the same type as this other one here. It's like it's another bird as opposed to going all the way over here that it's a fish. Um, and so that question of sort of what that space looks like and how speciated it is, it's an interesting question. And I, I don't think we know, I, I could say for certain, we don't know the answer to how that works. Um, and uh, that might be an analogy for what happens in, in biology. And maybe that kind of thinking could get one to the, the way of estimating um, in, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in um, uh, the, the number of species. Um, a comment here from Riff. The fact that you can edit genes makes me think so much can be done to cure disorders and diseases. Yes, everybody thinks that. I mean, this is a great discovery of the last 10 years that could have probably been made a lot earlier, um, but um, uh, was, was really a very wonderful biological discovery. Um, and it's really a kind of a, a sort of a, you know, it's like engineering gradually discovers sort of, oh, there's this method for doing this thing. This is such a discovery in, in biology. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very much uh, something that one imagines that it will be possible to edit genomes to, uh, uh, to change things. I mean, you know, the, the, a slightly different approach that's another kind of innovative thing is the, is the mRNA uh, vaccines for, for um, this virus, which have the feature that they, you're basically injecting a little piece of sort of active genetic material that goes into cells and starts producing proteins. It's not something where you say, here's this finished goods, here's this finished thing, the body should react to it by producing antibodies, whatever else. It's rather, here's this seed that will now grow actual proteins inside cells. Uh, seems to be going okay, um, you know, not, it, that was something that had been being developed for many years, particularly as a cancer uh, vaccine approach because cancers tend to have very different genetics. They have all kinds of scrambled genetics in them. And the concept would be that given a particular cancer in a particular person, you would custom make kind of a piece of mRNA that would be a sort of a seed to produce proteins that would cause the immune system to react to those proteins and attack the cancer. Um, and that was something that people had, had worked on for, for a long time, but nobody quite knew how to deliver mRNAs to cells. And then uh, in, this, in this pandemic with the development of, of mRNA vaccines, uh, suddenly this whole lipid nanoparticle approach of encapsulating and sort of a, a microscopic version of a biological cell, you're encapsulating this mRNA to get it inside your biological cells where it can kind of go to work and start producing proteins. That was very much accelerated by the, by the desire to have vaccines uh, produced quickly and so that will no doubt have many consequences for, for medicine in the years to come, as will, as will gene editing. Although there are lots of details of that and lots of things where, you know, things have gone wrong and one has to worry about different kinds of effects. You know, one feature of biology is, you know, you think you're doing one thing, but there's something over here on the side that, you know, a, a typical example is you think you're making a drug that is going to have some effect on some particular kind of tissue in your body. But actually the shape of that drug binds a little bit to some completely different tissue that does something completely different. Or maybe in some people, because their version of the molecules in that tissue are slightly differently shaped, it binds to theirs, but not to other people's. And so it's, it's, it's always very difficult to know in reality, you know, what will happen with one of these theoretically good idea kind of medical approaches. And it doesn't, it doesn't help that of us 8 billion humans or whatever, uh, you know, we're all different. And, you know, you can say, well, I tested this on 100 humans, 1,000 humans, whatever. But it may turn out that the 10,000th human, it has some, some terribly bad effect. And that was extremely hard to predict because it just was an effect that came about because of some particular genetic feature of that particular organ, uh, that particular human that didn't really affect them in, in their ordinary, you know, life. But in the case of this particular drug, it bound to some protein in some way that wasn't expected and bad things happened. So it's very hard to, to figure out 
and that's sort of the theory of, of, uh, of um, uh, clinical trials and testing and so on, but you can never do it perfectly. And it becomes, uh, there are many complexities where you, particularly if you try and make drugs that are very customized to a particular individual, well, then you really can't do that kind of broad testing because you made something specific to that individual and testing it on a thousand people who are all different from that individual doesn't really help you. Um, okay, one, maybe one last comment or question here. Um, uh, happy comments. What if the malaria parasite has some kind of function in biological systems that we're completely unaware of? This is the kind of thing they say that they're always wondering about. Yeah, well, that's what happens. That's, that's why biology and things like that are really hard because there are, there are just so often these kind of unintended consequences, unintended effects. I mean, that, uh, there's a lot of even fairly fundamental questions in biology, but we don't really know why something happens the way it happens. And it's like, oh, you can just, you know, take out that, that piece of some tissue in a human. Oh, whoops, we didn't realize that had some little film thin, you know, inner skin type thing that we just cut through and, and that caused these problems. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's, there's a lot of, of unknown unknown, so to speak where we just don't really understand how all the biology works. Even if we did, it's full of this sort of computational irreducibility phenomenon of even if we know kind of how, what the setup is, that doesn't mean we're able to, uh, to figure out sort of what the consequences will be. And yes, this is the thing that uh, sort of regularly happens when people say, let's just, uh, oh, I don't know, what's a good example? Um, there've been so many of them I, and I don't know them in detail. But there are cases where people say, let's kill off the population of some kind of animal that we don't like around here. And then you pretty soon you discover that um, animals you did like uh, start dying off because they depended on eating the animals you didn't like, for example. I think mosquitoes, for example, I think are food for dragonflies. So I think by the time you, if you kill off all the mosquitoes, for example, the dragonflies won't have any food. Um, and then if the dragonflies don't have food, I don't really know what consequence that has. Dragonflies have been around a long time. They were around in the Carboniferous period. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how dragonflies fit into the ecosystem uh, for, for the world, but that's the, exactly the type of thing. You know, you say, we don't like this kind of organism. Let's get rid of that one. Oh, whoops. We just destroyed something at a different place in this kind of web of, of interdependent organisms. Now, you know, does that mean you should do nothing? Uh, no, it doesn't mean you should do nothing, but it's always tricky. And I think assuming that you know, you know, you know one effect and you say, yes, this is going to be the main effect. We don't like the, 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 the mosquitoes, for example. Let's just kill them off. Um, you know, typically things don't work as simply as that. There's a more complicated set of interdependencies and so on. And I don't know quite what the right strategy is. It's probably you try doing some things, you see what happens, you do another thing see what happens, and you kind of gradually uh, sort of ease into what's going on rather than saying, you know, we'll do just this or that. I mean, it, it's like, for example, one of the things that similar kind of issue, uh, you know, one of the potential ways of getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you know, there's a bunch of carbon dioxide that's put into our atmosphere by burning fossil fuels and other kinds of things like that, um, that you know, one flies planes, one, one has drives cars that, uh, you know, uh, burn gasoline, one has factories, one has all kinds of things that, that uh, you know, we want to do that put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so one of the questions is, well, can we do something else that pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? And so there are a whole bunch of, of schemes for doing that. But one of them, which people argue about whether it will really work or not, is to seed the Southern Ocean with iron. And in the, in the oceans, there are, there are plankton and algae and so on, which can ingest carbon dioxide. And so the idea would be, well, just make more of those. Just make the oceans be more teeming with critters that can ingest carbon dioxide. And then you can solve the problem of there being too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, so will that work? Will that not work? People argue about this. I think there was a, a moment when somebody just decided to go do it, go, you know, take a ship and just start dumping iron. I think that's the thing that, that helps these, um, these microorganisms grow um, and so on. And everybody said, no, no, you shouldn't do that. Um, 
and uh, but but you know the question of what the mechanism for if that is really a good idea if that's kind of like the oh we just do this and then we don't have a problem with you know the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and so on it's um, uh, that will be a win but but it's a hard decision to make and uh, uh, these things you know if you grow more algae does that mean you kill off the fish does it you know what what really happens difficult things to figure out and I think one of the things to realize is that the kind of simple science answers are almost never correct. And this is a this is a consequence of this very theoretical phenomenon of computational irreducibility that I kind of came up with in the 1980s, um, that uh, uh, sort of the, even though you may know the rules by which a system operates, knowing what consequences they will have is arbitrarily hard. And that's something that we see in practice, particularly in biological kinds of situations. And it's something where when we imagine a policy, when we imagine just saying, oh, you can, you know, let's just do this. Let's, uh, you're, you're kind of being, you might say, well, science proves that this works. That's usually a, a bad answer because there's computational irreducibility, which is a, a thing of science that's kind of in the back saying, well, actually there will be unintended consequences and you can't get rid of those. It's a fundamental feature that there will be these things that you can't readily predict from the beginning. And so you have to kind of adopt a, a slightly, uh, um, lower confidence, lower hubris um, kind of approach to, to dealing with the world um, to, to take account of the fact that there are things that science from within itself is telling you you cannot readily foresee. All right, I think we should uh, wrap up here. Well, thank you for very interesting questions and um, uh, that was fun to chat about. And um, uh, look forward to um, to chatting again next week. So I should wrap up, go back to my day job here. Um, and I don't know, actually I'm doing, I think my next uh, discussion is about basic science. So I get to do some basic science here. Um, anyway, nice to chat with you all and uh, 